guys. I'm here today with uh, with Tiens Engelbrecht, um, and uh, Tiens is an old teen, uh, teenage friend of mine. We were, <laughs> we were we were both in the same church together when we were teenagers, and uh, Tiens Engelbrecht and George Bushney uh, became uh, aircraft technicians. I think uh, George was in Seven Squadron, with, uh, and they both good mates with uh, Beaver Shaw, mm. and um, and I've just reconnected with TNC. He lives uh, reasonably close to where I live, and uh, so on a on a regular basis we get together for a cup of coffee, and um, and I'm here today to just uh, chat to Tiens, introduce you guys to Tiens, and uh, and hear some of his some of his experiences of of what it was like in the Rhodesian Air Force um, during during the war there. Went on a careers day to, to the Air Force. Yeah. And I saw this and I said, yeah, oh, this is this is good. And then considered, hmm, if I have to go to the army, then I have to walk through the Zambezi Valley. But if I join the Air Force, <laughs> then I could fly over the top. <laughs> and that's much better. You know? <laughs> So I applied and, and joined the Air Force in 72, February 72. Right. Yeah. And uh, you, you, how did you, you became a tech, hey? And, mm. and apparently you and Beaver were on the same course? Beaver was a year after me. Uh, okay. Yeah. But George Bush and myself, we were together and a whole lot of other guys. Mm. And uh, what was interesting was that we did our nine months initial mechanical training and square bashing and rifle range stuff and all the rest of it. And then in Christmas of 72, um, we'd got a whole lot of choppers in Alouette threes. And they said, guys, we're going to have to assemble these Alouettes. So they started two 12 hour shifts. Sure. And, you know, we had only really been out of training school for three months. And uh, we started building Alouette threes. And I remember one morning, early morning, um, we were do, we did the night shift run, and uh, a trog came in, Trojan, one of those yes. fuel converters yes. to noise, <laughs> came in with a farmer from Centenary. Him and his wife had been. Um, had been uh, in an ambush, I think a, a landmine actually, now that I think I might be wrong, but I think it was a landmine and they were very badly injured. And so they were casavacked into, into New Serum and then taken off. And it was about a week later, I would imagine, uh, maybe 10 days, we were still building helicopters and the same thing again. The truck came in early morning and it was this farmer. He had gone back to the farm and him and his daughter, his daughter must have been about 10 years old, I think, were ambushed again. Um, either hit a landmine and ambushed or just an ambush, I, I can't remember. But all I could remember was that he was just saying, is my daughter okay? Is my daughter okay? In the, sure. in the whole condition of the injuries and their shock and all of that, this was the second time within... 10 days or a week and it might have even been five days, mm -hmm. you know, and you're young. I mean, I, w I joined the Air Force when I was 17 and three months old. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, you're kind of like saying, what on earth is going on? Mm -hmm. But you've just got a task ahead of you and you just press on and do the job, mm -hmm. what you're called to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I grew up. Um, Before you get carry on, can I interrupt you? Yeah. Um, um, they, those trogs, they, I'm sure I got strafed by one of those ones and rocketed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and we it, did. It, would it be, it's, it kind of makes this noise like, oh, <laughs> and then suddenly it goes silent Yeah, as it starts its dive <laughs> and then it, then it releases its, its payload of rockets yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And then, oh, yeah. Starts climbing, climbing out that again. A, is that a, tro a Trojan? That's a Trojan. Yeah, because that happened to me in Mozambique <laughs> once. And fortunately, I found a big tree to hide behind, so yeah. the rockets didn't do any damage. Yeah, but yeah. Gee, it was scary. No, the, the Trojans were terribly slow. I remember doing bush changes. 
and if you heard that the changeover was on a Trojan, you knew you were going to spend you know, about five or six hours in the air before you got back to base again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry to interrupt your train of thought. No, no. Yeah, so then I um, came off building helicopters and went on to um, I went on to three squadron Dakotas. Right. And uh, there I spent many years um, on DAX, and it always amazed me how these troopies would want to jump out of a fully serviceable <laughs> aircraft <laughs> at night at altitudes in the daytime with no altitude. <laughs> mm. um, it was really amazing and I think when you see how sometimes the guys had to get pushed into the deck, they couldn't even climb up the steps. They mm. were so heavily loaded mm. with equipment and all the navigation lights were masked up and you know, it was like they're off and this is like, you know, 10 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock at night. And off the deck would go and mm. come back in the early hours of the morning empty. Mm. Um, and you just wondered how far did these guys get chucked out mm. and, and find their way back home. Yeah. I remember um, again going out, with, it was probably my first bush trip on a deck. As, as engineer or mechanic or petrol boy <laughs> <laughs> and those days we still hadn't even camouflaged the decks they were still silver mm -hmm. and um, I think it was Mavura Donna there near Matoka they decided there were some gooks in, a, in, a, in, in the caves in the cliffs mm. And uh, they felt that the, if the DC got on up there and we had these big sky shouts and a massive speakers in the doors mm, mm. and um, he could speak to them, he could convince, convince them to lay down their arms and come out and surrender. Mm. And here we were at night flying below the height of the mountain, sure. full moonlight, as if, you know, uh, nothing is going to happen. You know, when you look back now, you say, what on earth were we doing? <laughs> but you get on and you, you know, you survive and you do the job. Yeah, and yeah. I don't know how successful that was, but mm. that's just one of my early days yeah. of uh, getting out. So I remember you saying something to me once about um, how as an aircraft engineer, if we're going to call you a petrol boy, um, you it was up to you to sign off on the airworthiness of the Dakota, mm. you know, at the tender mm. age of 19. Yeah, know? yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing the responsibility that a 19 year old boy has. Eh? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it is very much like that, John, you know, but I think again, our training was so good mm. and our discipline was so good. I remember we were down at uh, Mukambura, somewhere there with a deck. And um, it developed an oil leak on the one engine. And um, I checked the oil levels and we, we always carried extra engine oil in the aircraft in any case. And, and I put in what we had and um, I entered into the aircraft documentation that we had an oil leak, but I cleared it to fly. And so we flew back from there all the way back to New Serum and um, when we got, when we landed, the oil was actually dripping off the back of the wing. Sure. And the warrant officer came out and he looked at this and he said to me, Tiens, how on earth could you do that? I said, well, it was either an engine change in the bush or here. I said, I got it back for you. He just shook his head and turned around <laughs> and walked away. Um, but that, that was, I think, the standard of, mm. of the technicians and um, engineers that were raised yes. um, in, in the Air Force. Yeah. Um, I remember at Grand Reef, a police air wing aircraft came in and his um, alternator or generator wasn't charging. And he asked if, if I could have a look at it. And it was just a simple thing to fix, but it's an aircraft that you never work on. Mm. 
and I got it sorted out for the guy and he was so happy he thought that you know these guys are the cleverest <laughs> um, techs because he would have had to fly to to um, Salisbury to get it fixed yeah but we were able to I was able to get it going for him again mm. and fix it all up yeah yeah but again it's just what we did you know? yeah so were some of those ducks quite badly shot up they were yeah it's amazing they could still fly. Yeah? They could still fly. Um, I remember we were a couple of ducks together. In fact, my friend George Bushney was on the one, and he got shot, or well, the duck got shot underneath, and the bullet went into his toolbox sitting between his feet. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and um, when we landed, uh, he called me and he said, Tiens, look at this thing, it's full of holes. And uh, yeah, they were very very well constructed and you could take they could take a lot of um work but again if you knew the internal workings of where your control cables and your fuel lines and stuff like that hydraulic lines mainly yeah. were then you could say okay that's all out of the way so your chances of it having picked anything up where those bullets were um was pretty pretty slim so you you could take it off take a chance and just patch up the holes with some masking tape until you got back to base and do a proper repair on it. Mm, mm, um, yeah, I remember coming in also around Kenyamba way later on in the years. And uh, we were in connection with, with internal affairs. They were, they were supposed to have cleared the runway for us. and But their radios were very bad and it was crackling a lot. And we came into land and... Gee, um, we took off some branches or some thorn trees on the wingtips because it just wasn't wide enough to get the deck in there. <laughs> and uh, when we landed and stopped the engines, the guys came running to us. And um, one of my friends from the youth, you might know him, Mike Willis. Yes. Mm came right into the deck and he, and he saw me there and he said, Tien, so you guys okay? So I said, yeah, we, we're fine. He said, the gooks were at the end of the runway hitting, pumping mortars at you as you were coming into land. Sure. And we were just fortunate that we never picked up anything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I was stationed at Grand Reef, also on the deck at that time. And... Uh, uh, down at Nyanyazi, the big irrigation scheme along the Sabi River, I think the Sabi or the Lundi, Sabi I think it is, um, PTC um, had a camp. They were doing some, obviously some work there, and they dug a big pit and pulled a tent over it, a piece of tarpaulin, and they were bedded in there at night. And the gooks got in through the fence and just lifted the side of the tent and just shot them up. Sure. And um, they asked for a Kazavak. And so, uh, this is at night time, and I can't remember what time, but it must have been, you know, 10 or 12 or something like that. And we set off, and it was like broken cloud, but again a full moon. Mm. And um, as we took off from Grand Reef, all those dwellers, those round granite copies, you would just see one just pass underneath you, whoo, gone. Um, as we were, you know, climbing out for height. And then we were flying down along and uh, the one pilot said, but according to his navigation, we should be at the, at the airstrip at Nyanyadzi because the police um, were going to clear the runway for us and then um, put up some Land Rovers for light so that we could land there. Now, the airstrip from Nyanyazi couldn't have been more than five k's away from where this incident took place. But fortunately, I knew the area. And um, I just said to them, let's just fly down until we hit Birchenau Bridge, because you can't miss Birchenau Bridge. I said, then we'll turn around and we'll come back up, back to the Grand Reef direction upstream. And then we're going to find it on our right hand side. So we did that. We found the bridge, turned around, and as we were coming back, we eventually made comms with the, um, with the police. And they said, no, they were at the airfield because they should have been at the airfield already. Now you can imagine this is at night time, 
we've got this roaring deck and what's going through your mind is that the attackers of this camp would could think that it's either going to be a helicopter evacuation which they're not going to do so easily at night so it could be the DAC that would come in and do that kind of evacuation because I can't even remember how many people were injured but we probably took out about 10 roughly maybe more maybe less guys that were wounded and you come in in now and you're thinking right these gooks could have by this time moved to the airfield and waited with their RPGs mm, mm. for you to come in and land and they're just going to take you out yeah and so the pilots and myself we just said okay well there's only one way to do it and that is going to come down and hopefully pick up the lights which we eventually did and undercarriage was down and then somehow when the the landing lights came on we were just about on the ground and we the pilots put that deck down parked it swung it around and i said come guys load 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 because now we want to get out of here as quickly as possible mm -hmm. and um it was amazing one of the sitting casualties was a guy that had been shot in his forehead but high up and the bullet went around the inside of his head and came out the back and he was a sitting casualty sure and other guys were obviously not as lucky as him you know they were bleeding a lot and mm. yeah but i think that that was one of my my frightening experiences as well because mm. you, you're just so vulnerable mm. there's nothing you know once you've committed to land you committed to to land in and if you have to change your mind well you just hope the best that you're going to get out of there yeah, yeah. and go back get out of it yeah sure so Tiens and i have been talking um he uh, Tiens has, uh, and his wife have been missionaries for many years um in zambia um right on the shores of lake kariba actually and uh and he's been telling me some interesting stories about um, about some of the answered prayers that uh, that and some of the interesting encounters that have happened to him since the war. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Tiens now to tell us about that. So Tiens, you were telling me about this this <laughs> guy you met who you were sharing a pulpit with him at a at a Christian conference. Mm. And he was actually ex-Zambia National Army uh, in an anti-aircraft unit. Yeah. And uh, and and you guys said, I mean, you know, you guys were on the opposite end of a punch-up. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> why don't you tell us that story? Yeah, John, um, amazing. And it, it's where we're now, 2000, probably in uh, about 2005, 2007, five probably, I was in Livingston at a conference and um, I was just sitting casually at a table and just talking to this guy and uh, you know asked him about you know what did what had he been doing in his life and you know how did he become a Christian and that kind of stuff and he told me the story of um, during the war days how there was an attack on a on a town in Zambia I think it was fire yeah I'm sure it was and how he was in the um, the Zambian Army anti-aircraft unit. So they had the anti-aircraft gun set up in the side of a gomo on a sort of like a cliff face, if I can understand him correctly. And um, he was that time he said he was on drugs and he had been boozing up, and that's how that's that's how they lived there. And he said all of a sudden the aircraft came in from the Rhodesian side, and and all he could see was just the fire coming out of the nose of this aircraft the, as the cannons were flying, were shooting, and the bullets were flying all around him. These were hunters, eh? I think they were hunters, yeah. Probably if I look back now, it probably wouldn't have been vampires. It would have been the hunters. Mm. And uh, he, he started panicking because the bullets were all around him. And he shook his fist and he said, God, if you are the God of the Bible, then if you save me today from this then I will serve you for the rest of my life 
And he said, you know, when the hunters started coming in and they wanted to start shooting back with the anti-aircraft guns, their, their guns jammed and they couldn't shoot. And uh, he said for three quarters of an hour, they tried to unlock, unjam that, that anti-aircraft gun. And by that time, the attack had finished and the hunters had moved off and then they managed to release it and to get the gun to, to operate again. But now there was no need for that uh, as an anti-aircraft gun. And years later, here we're sitting at a table um, and talking at a conference in Livingston, um, standing next to each other. You were part of that op, right? Yeah, I was a part of that op. Yeah, at that time I was on, on Lynx, as working on the Lynx. And uh, we were in on, on that as well, yeah, that op. So it was amazing that how, you know, being in the operation, I could, because I don't think we had many operations. I only knew of the one which I was involved in. Um, but it was a long operation. It was, it became more complicated than what was originally planned. You know, the Zambian um, National Army brought in a whole lot of truckloads of stuff which they had to be sorted out with um, bridges blown up and that kind of stuff. So it took a lot longer to, to get the op finished. Mm. And um, yeah, so I was on that one as well. And he was on the other side of the river. And yeah, we both live to tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. a lovely story. Man. Yeah. So yeah, then I, I did um, quite a number of years on, on four squadron, the, the Lynx. Um, the Lynx was then a pretty new aircraft for us. So it was nice um, compared to the old Trojan. Because even at that stage, even just before I went on to 4 Squadron, we were still using Provost, the old Provost, the piston engine, radial piston engine Provost, with a little bit of armament on it and 303 um, Browning machine guns in the wing. And um, that was phased out and then eventually the Trojans were phased out and they were just more like crew changes. We used the Trojans for and maybe small transport operations if some army guy wanted to go somewhere then they would use the old trog. Um, but again, with the, uh, with the Lynx, um, that, was, that was nice because it had a lot of good armament on it. And I'm sure many of you guys have had happy days when a Lynx has come over and hopefully got the Fran over your heads <laughs> and, and not into you. But we had some, some very good pilots, I must say. Um, and I remember um, coming in to land at Grand Reef uh, we were doing a crew change coming out of out of Thornhill and we weren't too far out. We were kind of like settling in for long finals actually coming into Grand Reef. And then all of a sudden we just heard these bullets flying around us. And uh, we did a U-turn and came back to see who was, who dared do that to us, you know. Um, but all we could find was just some locals um, cutting firewood, but I'm sure they... They pushed the AKs into the firewood um, because there was absolutely nobody else around. Mm. But we still, it still wasn't a definite. We didn't have anybody with a weapon in their hand that was now shooting again at us. So we just had to call it a day and turn around and <laughs> carry on and land. Um, another good time was Chipinga. Um, I was flying with Martin Hatfield. And um, he had gone out. I was still in Grand Reef. He had gone out. wasn't it was supposed to have been anything special. Just do the normal radio communication up in the sky. He just fly, fly around for two hours, mm. you know, getting bounced around in the hot weather. And um, he was called in for an airstrike. And he came in, and as he pulled out, he got revved up the backside. Man, this this lynx was full of holes. So they. They got a pro guy to fly me out to Chapinga because he landed in Chapinga. And uh, I had a look at it and I just said, no, this aircraft has just got too much. We needed to do a one-time flight to Salisbury um, to have it repaired there because they had the special jacks to do stress panel, to take the stress panels off the bottom of the wings and stuff like that. But the powers to be said, no, fly it back to the squadron. The squadron want to have a look at it first. And when we eventually got there, they had to fly it up to Salisbury in any case. But going there, you know, now you're flying and to the best of what I could evaluate, 
and no cables have been hit and anything like that. So we we should be fine. And sure enough, we were. And I uh, picked up another aircraft in, in Thornhill and came back to Grand Reef and carried on. Um, I think one of the other things you talk about the Trojans with the um, the noise converters on again with Martin and myself, Martin Hatfield, we were flying out. Um, I think we were doing a crew, a crew change in Chapinga as well again. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said to me, Tienz, this aircraft is flying one wing low. He said, I'm keep on trimming it out and I noticed that. Um, he said, I don't know what's going on with this. So I said, okay, well, let's land. And we had just flown past the Bikita mine. Mm. And uh, and they had an airstrip there, so we landed. And um, the first thing you do is obviously just check your fuel tanks because that's the only thing that gradually gets less mm. is your fuel. And I checked it, sure enough, the one side was down to just making the dipstick wet at the bottom and the other side was pretty full. So I said to him, I think that's our problem. You know, we, we're draining the one the one side and the other side is still full. Then I checked the, the aircraft documents and the guy who refueled it never refueled it the same on both sides. For some unknown reason, it was less. And that's the side that we had selected, that we had been flying on, that Martin had been flying on. So now those Trojans had a, a problem starting when they were hot. They were a son of a gun. And so we got this truck pushed way back, because now it's midday as well, so it's, the air is thin, it's hot, <laughs> and we wanted to get as much runway as we possibly could to get the thing off the ground in any case. Never mind, that was after we had got it started. And he ran the battery flat, couldn't start it. But now we were doing a, a crew change, so I had a, a 24 volt, the trucks were um, 12 volt, and we always had jumper leads in them, so we could jump it off a Land Rover battery or something like that, because it, that's just standard, you know, you just carry jumper leads for the old <laughs> Trojan, you know. <laughs> oh, they were terrible, man. <laughs> and, uh, we would always say that's the only aircraft that could get a bird strike on the trailing edge of the wing. <laughs> um, so I said, okay, we've got this 24 volt battery, and um, I kind of like figured out where on the terminals where 12 volts should be, about halfway down the battery. <laughs> so I plugged it into the aircraft and put on the jumper leads, run about 12 volts. Man, and this thing started up, man. <laughs> that prop turned, I think I must have had more 20 volts than 12 volts, you know. <laughs> but we started the trog and um, headed off down the runway. Now normally they would set a little bit of flap so that you could, you know, get airborne. But I noticed Martin had no flap. And we were going down the runway and then all of a sudden the flap lever was in the middle of the aircraft. He grabbed it and he pulled it down and this thing lifted off the ground like a helicopter, man. (laughs) 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 And uh, we got airborne and we were climbing out. Now, because it was so hot, we had taken off our helmets and all the rest of it, you know, we were trying to cool down a bit, you know. Mm. And we had got airborne, I don't know how long, but it it wasn't long. but now you must remember, because we knew the one tank was just about empty, we had selected the full side on the fuel cock. And we got airborne and maybe minutes, and that Trojan's prop stopped. Dead. That was it. And we didn't even have time to look at each other. We just looked for our helmets. Because underneath us was just trees. And the discipline would would have been to reselect your fuel cock, first thing. Select another another fuel tank. Now, that would have meant that Martin would have selected the fuel tank that we knew was empty. So the fuel tank that was full, um, if, the, if the fuel was a problem, we, um, we had no more fuel because we were selecting... That so we would have had to try and start it and hopefully that the problem was somewhere else and then go back to the full tanks. So he selected the empty tanks and cranked it and that trog fired up. And I tell you, by that time you are drenched in sweat. 
And uh, when we landed in Chipinga, I realized that when I dipped the fuel tanks that the aircraft had just come off a major service at a civilian company. And they connected the fuel cocks, the fuel tanks, they crossed the lines of the fuel tanks. So in actual fact, we had selected the full tanks. And that's why we could carry on flying. Because, but now we're expecting this thing to stop at any time again. Yeah, because yeah. we're flying yeah, on an that. empty tank. Yeah, exactly. But after a while you realize, okay, no, 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 no. We're, we're okay. We're going to be okay. But until then, and, and it was again just the discipline of the pilot. Never mind what you know. This is the procedure. You select another fuel, uh, a fuel tank, and you crank and you get that thing to go because you've got booster pumps you know so you've got pumps that are pushing fuel now into the engine which is run dry and uh, that um, was uh, such a principle in my life that you you trained you disciplined mm. and you carry that out and it saved our lives that day sure we saved yeah what a story yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, so Martin, you know, even in Chipinga as well, he got revved up. And I remember also at Chipinga, we were working with the scouts, um, giving them top cover. And I was busy servicing those brownings on the top of the links. We had two, um, three or three brownings up there. Um, and they carried 600 rounds aside. And the magazines were inside the aircraft. And the belts went up out of the aircraft into the into the, uh, the, uh, the browning, into the machine gun, and then the doppies came back down into a bag. And I was busy servicing them. It was a normal day, nothing happening. And the scouts got a, a, a radio message. One of their guys who was in Mozambique, um, he said to them, I've, I'm now leaving my radio. He said, I've dropped my kit. These guys are running behind me. I'm running from them. And he said, it's something like for the last day or through the night or something like that. He said, I've been running and just dumping my kit to keep away from these gooks. They, they're chasing me. And um, he said, I've now just got my, my, my weapon. And he said, there's an LZ. And he gave us a grid reference. And we had the choppers with us and the links. We were working together with the scouts. And Martin was again was, was with me. He came out and he said, Tians, close up. I said, but you know, I've got this one browning stripped. He said, just close the panels and just load the one side up. Just on the one side for me, we're off. And um, the helicopters have got airborne. They were headed out and the links. And I think the, the Salute Scout guy came with Martin. I didn't go with into the ex, into across the border. But I think he got in with Martin and they flew over and they, they did a hot extraction and they got this guy out and um, came back to Chipinga. But again, it was just, there was a job to do and you just got in there and do, did it. You know, you didn't wait for a second machine gun. You just say, you know what, I'm going with what I've got. He had Franz on and he had some 37 mil snebs on there so he could handle, mm -hmm. but he only had the one machine gun, which was, for cover when coming into attack mm. because they would let go with those ahead of the the delivery of the weapons to get the guys heads down mm. so that they didn't get rare from the front and hopefully that would be enough to keep their heads down with the, with whatever they delivered as they pulled out mm. Mm. and and I remember doing some um, armament runs uh, gunnery runs at um, in Kwekwe at uh, Rutenga, no, not Rutenga, no, I forget the name of the airfield that we had there, the, the armament airfield outside Kwekwe. And uh, it was amazing for me that when you pulled out that, that with that links, that your mask, your radio mask, actually felt like it was sitting on your chin. That's how much G-forces that, that aircraft could go, you know, could pull that push pull mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. they were really an amazing aircraft they they were strong um and they did a good job sure mm. yeah right. again stationed at um at Rutenga, i think it was it could have been buffalo range um with ian bond um he was a, a tf pilot 
I think he played rugby for Rhodesia as well. And uh, we were relocated to Fort Vic. And uh, it was a cloudy day and we climbed out above the clouds and the sun was just setting and the whole, all that stuff was like a purple maroon color and it was absolutely amazing and how peaceful, it was like flying on silk and we looked at each other and we said, gee, this, this is only the work of a wonderful creat creator God. And uh, we landed in Fort Vic. We came in through that misty, gooty weather. We landed at Fort Vic. And we hadn't been there long either. And some guys arrived with the police. And they had a Peugeot 404 station wagon and a Peugeot Bucky and a police Land Rover. Nobody was aware that this group of people were coming to the airfield and they arrived there and they spoke to the in charge people and they had traveled all the way from um, Cheredzi or Triangle somewhere like that and in the Peugeot station wagon was a, an ele a, a, a young girl I think she must have been about 11 years of age and she was sick and they had traveled into the night, into the darkness, riding shotgun. And the parents were with her and they had a, a medical doctor with them as well. And they said, please, could she be casavac to Salisbury? She had got cerebral malaria. Sure. And obviously the go ahead was given, but now... In that kind of configuration in the links, we had we had fold up stretches, but it took the one row of seats. And we had to take all the seats out so we could get the stretcher in, which was fine. We, I mean, that's just what you do. And as they were starting, well, as I was helping them to, I was inside the aircraft taking the stretcher because we had to transfer this child from where she was in the in the station wagon onto the stretcher and then put her into the aircraft. And as I was putting her into the aircraft, her eyes just rolled back in her head. Now her parents are standing outside the aircraft door and, and they're in a state of shock. They've traveled like, I don't know, crazy through all the possibilities of ambush and stuff like that to get to... Um, to, to get to Fort Vic, and here we are, we had just flown in that afternoon, and they said, please, can you take it? So their hopes now, all of a sudden, started, must have started getting, there was some hope now. But there wasn't any place for anybody else except the pilot and the doctor. And I looked at this girl as she rolled her eyes back, and my heart just sank. And I I gestured to the doctor, I called the doctor, I said, come over here. And he said, what is that? I said, look at this. And he took one look at this little girl's face. And he opened his bag and he pulled out a syringe and gave her an injection. And he said, we going. And they jumped in and Ian Bond took off. And I tell you what, I don't even think the undercarriage was up because it was dark now. The lights disappeared into the cloud just after takeoff. And he got that child back to, to Salisbury. And we never got to ever hear again about what happened to her. But that was irrelevant. The issue was, like with the chopper guys, you had to do what you needed to do now. And we picked up Kazavax and we took them to where they had to be. And then it was out of our hands. We cleaned up, cleaned up the aircraft, refueled, and we carried on for the next day. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, in all of my Air Force days, I would have them over again anytime. Mm -hmm. We worked, 
um, I remember one night working on a, on a Cessna 185 um, in the hangar in Salisbury. It had, a, it had an engine problem. And my other friend, Harold Baker, and myself, we were working on this aircraft all night. And in the early hours of the morning, we eventually got it all fixed up because it was due to fly that morning. It was going back down south. And uh, we got it all ready, and the pilot jumped in early just at dawn. And he was gone, at a, and at about half past eight, nine o'clock might have been, the warrant officer came and he took the the, the aircraft document um, book, what we call the F-700, he took it off the shelf and he called Harold and myself in to his office. He said, close the door. He said, that aircraft is pranked. And we just looked at each other and we just went white. And we said, we know we had a, an engine problem on that aircraft, but we know that when it took off, it was fixed. Has this thing now packed up and this aircraft is pranked? And so now when, when they take that 700, that means that there's no more entries. You can't change anything. What is written is written. And we signed that aircraft off as serviceable to fly. We signed the, the repair off as having been, or the fault of, as having been repaired, and that that engine was good to fly. And later on, it must have been 12 o'clock or so, he called us in again. And I can remember just standing there, and you don't know what to do with yourself. And he said, they found out what the problem was. The aircraft we had put in bulletproof seats, um, armored plated seats into the aircraft. And then you have to, what we call a compass swing, you have to readjust the readings on the compass because it's now no longer going to read true because of the steel on the, on the, um, the seat, the bulletproof seat. And so there's a deviation card which says if you're going to fly at 10 degrees, you've actually got to fly at 15 degrees so that you can compensate for the compass moving out because of all the extra steel, metal in the, in the cockpit. And this pilot had never done that. And so he ran out of fuel in Mozambique and then he had a crash land. But he was still okay. He survived the crash landing. But it just hits you that... This is your responsibility. There's only two signatures on that document, and that's yours and somebody else's. Mm. And you're going to take the punch, mm. whatever comes. <laughs> but yeah, so these things happen, but it is no big hero. It happens to so many other guys, and so many other guys have got stories, even when they blew up the petrol tanks there in Salisbury, and then they blew them up in, in Fort Vic, and how... From South Africa, they brought in Hercules full of that foam, that ox blood stuff. And I can remember on my own one night loading a deck with 25 litre drums of, of that foam just alone. And, and they heavy, they weigh more than 25 kgs each. And you put the thing down and because the deck's at an angle, it wants to hop off and roll down again. And you've got to tie it up and then... But you know what? Nobody battered an eyelid. You know, it's just like the chopper techs, it's just like the troopies, it's just like what everybody else did. Mm. There was a job to be done, you bit the bullet, you did the job, mm. Mm. and didn't expect a, clap, a pat on your back mm. every time you did something like that. Mm. That is just what you were paid to do. Mm. And so my years in the Air Force were a great training school for me for life even after my days in the Air Force. Mm. Um, like I said just now, I'd have them back any day. <laughs> we had hard times. We had good times. Mm. We had good fun. And um, we did a lot of stuff. I remember... You want another story? <laughs> <laughs> you can take it off if you don't want it. Yeah. This, this time I was at um, FAF 1 at Wanky on, on the Islander. And... Um, 
we had been asked to take um, a police guy down somewhere towards Bingo Way. And on our way there, the DC phone radioed in and um, obviously must have heard us flying overhead and whatever, contacted somebody who contacted us and said, an old Tonga guy on a scotch cart had hit a landmine last night and he's come across him early this morning. Is it possible that we could Kazavak this guy out? And there was an airstrip not too far away. So we got permission and the pilot and myself, he was also a TF pilot, um, landed the, the, the Islander and uh, put this old Tonga man in. Now you can imagine he's been hit by a landmine. He's been laying outside all night. And now he's putting into an aeroplane. <laughs> so the shock level just goes up more. But this policeman was there with him. And so we're taken off and I was flying back to Wanky, actually piloting myself. That was lovely. We had opportunities like that because it'd be useful if the pilot did get shot, that at least you knew a little bit how to fly the thing on whatever aircraft you want on the fixed wings in any case. So I was flying back and... Um, I noticed that the pilot kept on looking back over his shoulder. And I said to him, what's going on there? He said, this, this police guy, um, a white guy, is giving this Tonga man um, mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And, and I, I think it was something like maybe half an hour this was going on. And we had radioed ahead to to FAF1 Wanky and told them to get an ambulance ready. This was the situation. This man was in a bad state, but this cop, this policeman was, was doing the best he could. And I was coming down. We had done finals. We were settling into land. And then the pilot said to me, he's dead. And we could see the runway. We could see the ambulance. Everybody was there. If he could have hung on for 10 minutes, he could have had a better chance of survival. Mm. But my hat goes off to that policeman who didn't bat an eyelid. He just got in there and did what he could do to try and save that black Tonga man's life. Mm. Mm. But it just didn't work. Mm. Mm. And then on that same trip, um, Patu had been chasing a group of gooks through um, Wanky National Park. And they'd run out of water and ammunition. And they asked us to go and resupply them. So we said, yep, we're ready. So they sent the police guy. And um, I said to him, right, here's a parachute. Tie it onto the ammunition box. Because I have to now prepare the aircraft for flying. You know, I've got to check that we're all good to go. And I loaded the ammunition boxes in. And we have had like tubes of frozen water. Did you ever have that drop for you? Mm -hmm. That ice. Mm -hmm. We had bags that were frozen up and then you just drop those. So it just broke up and you could pick up the pieces and put it in your water bottles or whatever you guys wanted to do with it. We were going home tonight. <laughs> and um, this guy tied the parachutes onto the, the canvas handles that carried the ammunition boxes. And I said, you idiot. But I said, there's nothing more I could do. We're going. You know, these guys wanted a resupply. And so we went up and we could take the one the side door of the of the island and I kicked these boxes out and I put my head out the window and the pilot said to me, how's it looking? So I said, it's looking like glitter. But <laughs> ammunition box came apart and all the cardboard boxes inside just opened up and there was ammunition flying around <laughs> the whole place. I think those party guys weren't too happy with the blue jobs that day. They can pick up all their bullets. But uh, just, uh, just yeah, something else. Yeah. Thanks, John. No, thank you very much, Tins. Um, yeah, thanks, Tins. It's been a great, uh, a great afternoon sitting here drinking coffee with you and eating hot cross buns. Um, mm -hmm. But I really enjoyed um, our time together. And I know you said, you know, we never got a pat on the back or anything, but um, certainly I can speak for on behalf of, uh, of of some of the RLI guys, anyway, that we we had a a relationship with uh, with the Air Force that really defined our our whole existence, and 
I, I, I for one just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for all that you guys did for us. Uh, giving us a lift into combat, <laughs> the most importantly, coming to fetch us again afterwards and looking after us while we were on the ground, you know, um, and uh, really, um, we couldn't have done it without you. And, and I just know that, you know, in, in the heart of every RLI guy, there's a, there's a special place for, uh, for the Air Force. So thank you very much, Tins. We really appreciate it, man. Mm -hmm.